So next week, you're going to hear from Eric Paulos, University of California, Berkeley. He will tell us what disobedient objects are. What are they for in hybrid landscapes? Today I have the distinct pleasure of introducing to you Jason Shankle, who was instrumental in making certain games of success that like Sims. I'm almost afraid to ask if anybody here played Sims. <laughs> one, and a half, one and a half people. <laughs> so, Jason Shankle has been giving us lectures for the past more than 20 years. Today he is going to explain to us functional programming. If anybody can explain functional programming, it is Jason. <laughs> so let's welcome our speaker. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Jason Shankel. I'm a um, um, senior game developer at Fable Labs Incorporated. It's a small startup uh, in San Francisco. Um, uh, but as George mentioned, four years I worked at. Maxis Electronic Arts on uh, The Sims and SimCity and Spore. And I'm here today to uh, um, talk about monads <coughs> and uh, what they are and why they're important now. So uh, before I get started, real quick, uh, who here has heard the term monad? Or is at least a little bit familiar? Okay, so one or two. Um, and uh, passing familiarity with functional programming versus imperative programming, what those things are? Okay, a little bit cool, so I, I don't think I, I overdid it here. Um, Okay, so what is a monad? If you've been spending time uh, looking at uh, um, programming in the last five or six years, uh, you know, UT presentations or, or the different kinds of conferences, especially around web programming and app programming, but really just programming in general, including systems and games, um, you'll be hearing a lot of uh, uh, rise of functional programming uh, coming into professional engineering, which basically, um, is about passing around functions as, as first class objects. And uh, what I'm going to present in this talk is that there's a reason why this, this is happening. There's a reason why we're, we're going through this cultural shift uh, in commercial engineering and adopting uh, techniques that are really you know, uh, quite old but have been mostly isolated uh, to academia. So typically when you, uh, and when you start you know, uh, looking at these kinds of the, you know, JavaScript conferences, web conferences, you know, the alpha conferences, lambda conferences, things like that, You'll, uh, you know, this word monad will start dropping in, and most people will just roll their eyes, or say it's a burrito, or <laughs> say that once you understand it, you can't explain it. And when it comes up is in a conversation between imperative programmers and functional programmers. Okay, so, um, and typically it's, it, it ends up being a kind of a conversation stopper because a lot of people who are practical functional programmers who don't have a deep mathematical background. Can, sort of have an intuitive sense of what monadic design is, but they can't really explain what that means. And imperative programmers, uh, you know, uh, just want to drink your soda and, and, you know, take it and shoot your friends. <laughs> right, and end this thing. So, uh, so important to understanding this topic is to understand a little bit of the history and the cultural place of imperative versus functional uh, programming. Uh, in software development. So this is the standard joke. This is the standard monad joke. A monad is just a monoid in the category of endofunctors. What's the big deal? <laughs> right? When you ask somebody what it is, that's actually a very good description of what it is. It's also a completely useless description. Um, I'll explain it really quickly. You don't have to completely follow it. Uh, but a monoid is a uh, functional system that uh, obeys two properties. One is that it combines values and returns a value of the original type. Okay, and the second uh, property is that it's associative. So we all, the first operation we ever learn in abstract math in kindergarten is uh, addition of integers. The addition of integers is a monoid. If you take two integers and add them together, one plus one equals two, two plus two equals four, four plus four equals eight, you can add integers all day long and you'll always get an integer. So that's the first, that's the first rule of a monoid. The second rule of monoid is that it's associative. If you have 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, it doesn't matter what order you do operations in, you'll always get the same value. So addition and multiplication in integers would be monoids. Uh, subtraction uh, or division in integers is not a monoid because when you divide two integers, you get a rational number, which is not necessarily an integer. It could be 3 over 2, right? And subtraction of integers is not a monoid because even though subtraction of integers 
always produces an integer. Uh, it does not behave, behave the associative property. Three minus two minus one, depending on how you parenthesize it, could, the result could either be two or one. Right? So that's the basic idea of a monoid. Endo functor I won't go into, just function, right? And so basically what a monad is, is an operation that allows us to perform transformations on functions that bring us back into monadic space where we can do the same operation again and again. What's the big deal? Say monad one more time. Okay. So imperative programming. Um, <clears throat> let's say we have a, uh, uh, a problem. You know, we have a, a collection of doctors, uh, some of whom may or may not be on staff at the hospital that we're concerned with. And we want to get a list of all of the male patients of all the doctors who are on staff uh, on our, in our facility. This is kind of a quick sketch in C sharp. Most of the examples I'm going to show you here are going to be in C sharp because that's, the, that's what I'm working in uh, these days. I do a lot of work in Unity. Uh, using what's called the link library, L-I-N-Q, uh, is the monadically designed functional programming library for C sharp. Uh, but it's not being used here. Uh, so if you were assigned this problem, you know, in, in CS 101, this, you'd probably do something along these lines in, in whatever your favorite language is. Uh, give me all the patients, you know, all the current male patients for doctors who are on staff. Okay, make a return array of patients, iterate over the doctors, skip anybody who's not on staff. If they are on staff, then iterate over their patients. If the gender is male, add it to the return list. And then you can also do, because you're telling the system exactly what to do, you can do some kind of hack here, where I'm poking a global variable, right? Saying, how many times have I ever added a patient to a list? That value is going up. Somebody in some other thread could be listening on that variable and waiting for it to exceed 10, and then you know, blowing up the world when it does, or whatever. So I'm having a, I, I have, because I'm telling the machine precisely what to do at each step, I can have any kind of side effect that I want. And I can affect anything else in the system that I want. Okay, and that is typically the source of problems for imperative programming, is the sh uh, sharing global mutable state, knowing that you're running along with other processes that might be running, and you're sharing resources. Okay, uh, and for this reason, we've developed over the years a discipline around imperative programming. Imperative programming has dominated the way we do professional software development. <coughs> Primarily because the world, excuse me, I slept today, I need a little coffee. Primarily because the world is imperative, okay? Uh, computers are essentially imperative systems, right? They have a stack, uh, uh, an instruction counter and a stack and some memory and a bunch of registers and on every cycle we advance the instruction counter, we execute the next instruction that might modify global memory, that might modify registers. Okay, and uh, when we started learning how to program computers, when we made programmable computers, this was the world that we were living in. So we have on the one of the advantages of the imperative thing is that we have precise control over the execution of the order of, uh, and the use of resources. Okay, so the dominant paradigm throughout my uh, pretty much my entire career uh, has been, especially for video game development, right, uh, has been that you have this machine as <coughs> a console or a PC. You pretty much own the hardware. There might be an operating system there providing with some services, but basically you, you have usually a single processor, and you are looking to optimize the way that that processor performs the functions of your game and, or your app or whatever else you're doing. Uh, and when you're in that world, functional programming uh, is kind of a non-starter. Um, because it's too high level, it's too abstract, you don't have control of how things happen, you just are telling them what to happen. So you do things imperatively, instruction by instruction. Go get this value, go get this other value, add them together, store the result here, print it out, store it back to a database, okay? There's a big idea that I'm trying to do, maybe I'm sorting or searching, you know, like g give me all the male patients of doctors on staff, but uh, the actual nitty gritty, what you spend most of your time doing is working out that algorithm for the optimal use of your resources. Okay, so you're close to the metal. Um, in my, you know, I guess it's going on 25 years of, of professional development, uh, the two top sources of bugs in an imperative system are uh, effects on the global mutable state affecting somebody else. So if I had that little hack counter and somebody else was using that hack counter for some other reason, uh, and we both interfered with each other, we're gonna get you know, unusable values. If someone is listening on that hack value because they think that someone else is gonna increase it, but then you increase it and they respond to that increase, 
you could end up with a crash because the client that they were trying to actually service was not really ready when they thought they were. They were using it as a cheap signal. There's all kinds of problems you'll find in, in encountering when you have an imperative system that goes in and says global state change, global state change, global state change. Especially when you're doing multi-threading, even on a single core system, if at any time execution can be taken from you and given to another thread, if you guys are sharing resources, you better have a very clean protocol about, how, about knowing what state things are in when your thread is reactivated. Right? And for this reason, when we do threaded programming in imperative systems, we put in a lot of blockers and stoppers and waiters and like, hold on, nobody do anything, I'm touching the database. Right? We have to manage the communication between threads ourselves. And worse than that, when we are managing threads ourselves as application developers, um, we can be on a system, like when threading was first introduced uh, you know, uh, into uh, consumer hardware, you know, back in the mid-90s when I was still working on this stuff, um, you know, even at the professional level, you might have a system that only has one core you know, back then, not anymore, but back then. And your code will work beautifully. Um, with one core, and the minute we actually got two and three core systems, it started to explode. And race conditions showed up when there's code that's literally running at the same time versus code that's sharing time, right? So your control of the environment becomes a big headache when you're, you know, uh, sh most of the bugs that are going to come in are because global state is being screwed up, especially in threads. The other one is the order of operations, right? Um, having to know that this precisely must happen before this, must precisely happen before this, is relatively easy, like in my doctor-patient example, because you have one big sheet and you just say, do this, then do this, then do this, and do this. Okay. However, if that function is being called in response to a signal or a message from, say, a web server that finally has a result for you several seconds after you asked for it, and that fires <coughs> off a callback that triggers this function while some other function expected it to already be called, uh, and nine times out of ten, you luck out and it, things happen to happen in the right order. And then that tenth time, it doesn't and things break and you didn't realize that you made this assumption. Order of operations will kill you. Why? Once again, because we're sharing global state. So if I do, if A happens and then B, that's different than B happening and then A. Uh, if A and B both depend on the, the changes you <coughs> make. Okay. So over the years, we developed technology and best practices to wrangle these inherent problems with imperative programming. Uh, the first is a breakpoint and state analysis based debugging. Uh, anybody here using Xcode or Visual Studio or MonoDevelop or any of these IDEs? So you know that, that you know, the pattern is you kind of write some code, something blows up, you set a breakpoint in your function and you get to that point where it blew up again and then you can examine local variables, global state, right? You put in some traces to tell you where you came from. You can look at the call stack, see how you got here. Um, the tools for doing uh, this kind of interactive debugging are, I mean, I was doing this stuff in college, when I was in college, you know, and that's, oh, cry me, that's 30 years ago. <laughs> um, you know, we had, it was one of these systems, when these really nice interactive debugging systems were first coming out. And now we've had several decades of development, uh, Microsoft Visual Studio, uh, especially is incredibly advanced in what it can reveal to you about the state uh, of your code when you set a breakpoint. Um, but that's inherently based on the idea that you're doing imperative programming, that you have line after line of instruction that you've written of what specifically to do, um, and that you're setting a point when you're looking and, and looking for errors in some of the assumptions that you might have made about the right way to do things, like divide by zero or, or something else like that. The other thing we've done to manage the complexity is over the years from assembly language to structured programming to object-oriented programming with design patterns, we've developed increasingly abstract bundles okay, that hide imperativeness from other bundles and become less and less dependent on what we used to call coupling. Right? So a good object system will just sort of be manage its own data and maybe you know create some instances of things that can get reported back to it or whatever, but it's not going to be counting on some other object existing unless it has a very clear existence interface that can be checked against, like a singleton or something like that. All of this is so that we can isolate and not have this kind of blur like we had back in the sort of the assembly language days of whatever memory I poke, somebody else can peek. It, it's, you know, I'm just you know, telling the, 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 the instruction system what to do. Okay. 
And what this has led to, this, this object-oriented design pattern based um, approach, which has done a very great job of, of wrangling the, the issues with imperative programming, is this created a, a status of programming that Steve Yege, who I recommend, uh, check him out on his blog, he's an interesting guy, he's got a lot of interesting philosophies. Um, he came up with several years ago with an idea called the kingdom of the nouns. Okay, so in development today, we are living in the kingdom of the nouns. Uh, just passing familiarity, Java, C++, C Sharp, object-oriented languages, right? Okay. So all of these languages proceed from the point of view that your fundamental first-class citizen is an object. It's a noun. It's data that supports an interface, and those are where the verbs are. And if you ever want to get a verb, it has to have a noun that, as its chaperone, right? So you'll see, especially in older uh, object-oriented code 10 or 15 years ago, very common pattern would be create, like if you wanted to pass around verbs, is that you'd create a command interface that says do command, right? Um, and then specific com commands would derive from it, and you'd pass these things around, and all it, and they wouldn't even have any data. All anybody would care about is that I can call do command and it'll do something. So it's pretty much a noun whose whole purpose is to wrap a verb. Okay, verbs in these languages are very difficult to pass around as first class citizens. In C, you have function pointers, and there are delegates in C sharp, but these are syntactically difficult to work with. Um, and you still have to define a function you know, uh, in place somewhere and get an address of it. You can't just, in the midst of code, write in and say, now do this you know, uh, uh, piece of functionality. Um, over the years, languages have been introducing easier and easier ways of liberating <laughs> verbs from the tyranny of nouns um, by uh, providing uh, delegates in C sharp, and then there were anonymous classes in Java where it's still wrapped in a noun, but you can at least lay it out in place and pass it off without having to predefine it. Um, but ultimately what's happened over the last several years is that all of the big languages are now introducing lambda functions. Okay, uh, Lambda functions, anybody work with a little bit? Okay, so lambda functions, uh, the idea uh, comes from lambda calculus and it was introduced you know, decades and decades ago into Lisp and Scheme uh, and other languages like that are basically anonymous functions where you just specify a set of parameters and a result and you can decide instead of making it a first class a top level value that has to be just you know called from somewhere it can be assigned to a variable and that variable can be passed around and it's essentially like a command interface without the noun wrapper it's just here here's this lambda function I'll assign it to a value called func and then somebody can call func with the right parameters and it'll do whatever the lambda function does and it's a way for us to write verbs in place uh, in code. So let's take a look a little bit of what that looks like. Okay, so the rise of the verbs. Right. Let's go back to our patient doctor um, uh, operation. So back in C sharp again in, in link, right? Uh, we're doing the same function um, that we did before, all of the male patients of doctors who are on staff. So we have this array of doctors or, or innumerable of doctors. And we say, uh, okay, doctors, uh, where a doctor's on staff. And that where function in C sharp is equivalent to filter uh, in uh, JavaScript or, or Scala or something like that. Okay. So what this is going to do is take a doctor list, produce another list of only doctors who are on staff. Then we change to the next function. It's called select many. Um, uh, in Scala, this is called flat map. Uh, in JavaScript, this would be a filter, uh, a map followed by a flatten call. Uh, and what this, what select many does basically is it takes a list of objects, iterates over every object, it has a function that can take one of these objects and produce a list of some other kind of object. And so it produces a list of these lists for, for, for every element in your array and then flattens it, right? And what this here is, this D equals uh, uh, syntax, this is what a lambda function looks like in C sharp. They've been introduced into C Sharp, they've been introduced into Java, they've even been introduced into C++. And you truly know that the verbs are coming when you have lambda functions in C++, because C++'s mission in life is to never make you pay for anything that you don't need, to be as close to the metal as possible. They don't even like making exceptions a part of the language formally, it's an optional part of the language because they add overhead uh, to every function call. And yet now even C++ is uh, supporting the notion that a function can be assembled at runtime and enclosed at runtime based upon wherever it's called from and then bundled up and, and handed out. It's that powerful of a, an expression 
that even a bare, even the bare metal languages are, are dealing with them. And so this is what a lambda looks like, right? So for each doctor, I'm receiving a D, right, which is a one for each one. If it's on staff, that's going to turn true or false, and this where function will select for everybody who returns true, you end up in the new list that goes to select many. Select many takes each doctor and defines a function that says, okay, for that doctor, in their patients, where the where a patient's gender is male, that's it. That creates uh, this function creates a little list of the male patients of a given doctor. Okay, that little list gets iteratively tacked on to the result, and then select many flattens it at the end, and I get one big list of patients. And just for convenience, right now we're not filtering out duplicates or whatever. So if a patient has multiple doctors, they'll show up multiple times in the list. But there you have it. So what are the advantages here? Very, first of all, very concise. You're not seeing here a bunch of how you go over a list of doctors, what you do to get to the next doctor, how you do these checks. I've just got these little components, like where. And in fact, uh, select many is all you ever need. You can define where in terms of select many. You can define map in terms of select many. You can define pretty much all of the list comprehensions that functional programming wants using flat map, select many, or a combination of map and flatten, depending on whether you're C Sharp, Scala, uh, uh, JavaScript and in all the other languages there's a version of select many as well okay there's no shared mutable state right in the course of doing this I don't have access here to my hack counter right this is a, both a benefit and a hazard the benefit is that I know that this code is completely isolated okay so it can run independently somewhere else I don't have to worry about it's not depending on any global state it's not going to change any global state it's just going to return a value However, what if I need a, to change global state? In fact, even just printing out a message on the console that says you added five patients, that changes the global state. And in a pure monadic language like Haskell, and, and, and if you really want to get into learning about this stuff, Haskell, H-A-S-K-E-L-L, -L, is a language that explicitly implements everything as monads. Okay? They've had to, just for the purpose of the reality of, uh, look, I just want to print out whether I got to this place or not, they had to create a special place called the IO monad, whose entire life is about allowing you to change global state for the purposes of debugging and things like that. It gets, it gets kind of inconvenient. Um, in a language like C Sharp or Java uh, that is not purely functional, that does not have these side effect requirements, you can introduce your global variable up in, the, uh, in your lambdas. Right? So I could put a D here on patients, right? Um, it, this, this D here can say, okay, if I have, you know, however many male patients I've got, add that to my, my hack value. So you can cheat in the languages that are of mixed mode, and most of them are. Uh, but in a pure system, you wouldn't, right? There's no side effects, okay? <sighs> Debugging is based upon traces, right? So whether you're just going to, you know, throw caution to the wind and go ahead and print out to a console, or whether you're accumulating a trace value that comes down the chain, Instead of hitting a breakpoint and saying what's happening here, because you're never really at an imperative point where you need to see did I increment or decrement this counter incorrectly, right? There's no breakpoints here that you can really set. What you want to see is what is the course of what happened. Okay, so we tend to replace breakpoint debugging and state examination with printf style, you know, the old trace debugging, and they're getting more and more advanced tracers that'll say your functional routine went through this much and you evaluated these five values and here's why. So, what you're seeing here, this doctors, where, select many, where, patient, blah, 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 this chaining of <coughs> functions where I have a, a list, I get a comprehension based on where, that's a different list that then goes to a select function that changes the list into a list of other lists of things that are different, okay, all, and I know that I can plug these things together with lambdas to get any kind of outcome that I want. That's not inherent to functional programming. That's not the way that functional programming necessarily is done. Any more than object-oriented programming and, object and good design patterns are inherent to imperative programming. You can do imperative programming any number of ways. You can do object-oriented programming any number of ways with really bad design patterns. Okay, This chaining is a powerful design pattern in functional programming that allows us to build very expressive code out of very, a handful of highly efficient components, which, by the way, are typically implemented imperatively under the hood, right? Because they have access to the metal that we don't. 
Okay. So what monadic design is, it provides this kind of flexibility and power, right? The same way that object-oriented design patterns provide flexibility and power in imperative programming. So that's the big picture here, is that monadic design provides for functions what object design provides for data. Okay. So I would like to tell you that, uh, you know, that we in professional development adopt a new paradigm because it comes out of academia having been tested over the years and find out that this is just a more powerful and a more elegant and a more expressive way of, of, of doing what we do and that we are these high-minded Aristotelian idealists, right, who adopted object-oriented programming because it was just more elegant than structured and structured was just more <coughs> elegant than immediate programming. Um, but that's not the case. We don't, we don't pick up and start to do things in a new way, especially if the new way is a very old way. You know, functional programming is actually you know, it goes back to the 60s at least, um, because it's just better, okay? We pick up a new paradigm because it solves a problem that we're having difficulty solving because things have changed for us, okay? So object -oriented, I'm, you know, old enough that I came into the industry when object-oriented programming was just first being picked up in the professional world. It had been around for a couple of decades as an idea, and it became this industrial standard. Why? Because we suddenly got tired of C and Pascal and things like that? No. It's because we encountered in the 90s a change in the computing environment where suddenly operating systems were highly component-based. And uh, we had to adapt to a world where we need to talk to very, very big heavyweight systems uh, like Windows and, and Mac OS X. Um, and we wanted to be able to isolate the functionality of those systems from the functionality of our systems in a way with a common language that we could all just say, here's my interface. Give me a call, do what you need to do, and give me your interface back, and I'll factory up whatever you need to do. And so uh, as the complexity of the interoperability of, of abstract components like under COM and Windows and, and shared object models uh, on Unix-based systems became bigger and bigger and bigger, the need to isolate them to very thin interfaces that, that, that uh, everybody could understand became apparent. And object-oriented uh, development provided that by giving us polymorphism, in uh, inheritance, and encapsulation, PIE. What PIE did for us was allowed us to write our little tough imperative systems and then advertise a general uh, interface to the world and everybody knew what to expect. We could do contract-based programming. I promise you that I will give you the sign of the angle that you hand me, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and we could share code much more easily. Whereas 10 years earlier, code sharing was still uh, a relatively minor concern. And so you could write big old spaghettified systems that did not have to, to publicize their interface. Similarly, um, with, as with what I'm calling the imperative age, which I find myself in, uh, where we're doing lots of functional styles inside of largely imperative programs, uh, is that there are basic realities about the way platforms have changed. The platform is the paradigm in the last 10, 15 years um, from the time you know, when, when I got started. First of all, um, it used to be a complete joke that you would ever run anything on a virtual machine <laughs> or trust a just-in-time compiler to, to, to do anything but slow you down. Java, when it got started, was an interesting idea. It had some, you know, there was some applicability to it. But fundamentally, if you're trying to write anything performant, forget about it. Nowadays, virtual machine performance is very, very good. Just-in-time compilers will beat any hand-optimized thing that you want to do. And so many of the applications that we run nowadays, we don't have access to the metal the way that we did back in the day. Even as a game developer, this is true. But uh, especially for web developers and app developers, you don't know what kind of hardware you're on. You're running in some kind of hosted environment. You're going to go be doing a bunch of SQL queries. Uh, it, you know, you're not talking to the CPU and saying how many cycles can I save doing this. Especially in web development and server systems where your bottleneck is typically communications with other systems. And so while you have your network card trying to get a bunch of data off of some, you know, co-server somewhere, the CPU time is not completely bound. And so the, the worry about am I calling functions in the most optimal way goes out the window because other parts of the hardware are already choking you down. So. You know, just the CPU has got time to look up a function address. Okay. Um, a lot of the problems we're solving now are big data, right? You go 
into like you know you have your map applications and things like that and you're in a city and it's like give me all the Starbucks around here you know or, or to tell me every every rock concert is going to play at this place in the next year and what, what these problems tend to be or or where we're doing statistical analysis of a huge body of people who've made certain reports on their health care or something like that uh, and we want to look for a trend in this massive wall of data um, when we're doing big data problems, it's often helpful to be able to take advantage of what's called lazy evaluation. If in my list of patients and doctors, I'm only really interested in the first patient on the list. I want to know who is the first male patient to sign up with one of our staff doctors, right? Then, and that list comes sorted by user ID, and I'm only going to look at the first value. And if there's some computational overhead to returning a patient record, you know, like it goes out and to the internet and looks up their current address or whatever. Um, then you shouldn't build, if there's 10,000 patients, you shouldn't take all that overhead, build a list of 10,000 so I can throw out all but one of them, right? So it's not until I ask for the first patient that the actual code that will evaluate that patient's data will get invoked, okay? And of course there's ways of doing this imperatively, but you have to think of it. You have to say, okay, we should actually just put in a bunch of instructions for how to evaluate this value and wait for somebody to ask and see and we have to I'll write my own little flag that says whether I'm evaluated or not and if somebody doesn't access her I'll I'll queue up an evaluation loop or whatever you have to think of it whereas with a a functional system it can come naturally the system itself in fact in fact Haskell uh, most of these systems are not very lazy C sharp's not lazy but Haskell is notoriously lazy it will not calculate anything until you need it. And it knows it doesn't have to calculate anything until you need it because there are no side effects to anything it does. So if I make my list of 10,000 patients, I, don't actually ha I know there isn't some hack value sitting somewhere that makes sure that all those patients were evaluated. So until you actually ask for my values, I'm not going to worry about them. OK, so all of this leads to what I think is my, the first bad answer I encounter for what is a monad came from two guys who I highly, highly, highly recommend. Uh, Venkat uh, Subramaniam Subramanium? <laughs> and Martin Odersky. Uh, you'll find them all over YouTube. Just Google for them and listen to their talks about functional programming. Martin Odersky is a developer of Scala. Scala is a, uh, a mixed mode uh, imperative and functional or object oriented and functional language developed on the uh, Java virtual machine. And uh, Dr. Subramaniam uh, talks about it, does a lot of examples in Scala. He also covers Haskell as well. And these guys are enthusiasts for functional programming, enthusiasts for, you know, they're working in the web space, and so especially all these server-based systems that give you where they take a call, Lambda callback, you know, they just, they just love that stuff. Uh, and they give some great talks on how to leverage the functional model, um, you know, if, you, if you're relatively new to it. But part of it is that they talk about monads, and they say that, yes, monads answer why it is that, func that the major limitation of functional programming, which is namely that you can't affect the global state, um, can be compensated for. Because monads can carry state forward, and so if you're making a bunch of changes that should be applied to the global state, at the end of a monadic chain, you can take the result and you can blit it somewhere into the global state and start over again. And that's pretty much how we solve the problem of fu functional programming's isolation from the real world because if you went with a pure functional system, you'd never be able to even develop a pocket calculator because pocket calculators have state. So you have to have some way of propagating state. And that is called a monad. And you can call it a burrito if you want to because it's just a wrapper for a value. And one of the things they said is you don't really need to know. You can just see how elegant these functions are and why they keep appearing, why every major language is introducing the same four or five functions like flat map or, or select many or whatever, they're all versions of the same thing. It kind of, monadic design kind of describes that. And you certainly don't have to waste your time reading into category theory. Because a, the idea of a monad comes out of an esoteric mathematical discipline called category theory. Okay. Now I've looked a little bit into the category theory. They're kind of right. You don't really need to dig into the categorical theoretical definition of a monad unless you're really into mathematics. It doesn't really shed a lot of light. Uh, but you do kind of have to grasp why it is that a monad does what it does for functional programming, how it corrals functional programming the way that object design corrals imperative programming. But once again, can't recommend them enough. Please uh, give them a look if you're interested, especially in, in web development, Java development type of, of, of thinking. Um, Subramaniam uh, has also got a great series of talks on the internals of the, of the Java 
uh, engine, which is what Scala runs on, and, and you know how functions get resolved, and how we can do lazy evaluation in Java. So highly recommended. But uh, left me unsatisfied on the question of should I look up what a monad is. So after listening to them, I looked up what a monad is. And so here we are. We're going to get into the formal definition real quick. Don't expect you to completely grasp this. It'll take a little bit of while, but it's really actually fairly simple. So a monad is basically an object, like a C++, a class, or, or C Sharp, or in, or in Java, okay, that wraps a value of a given type. Okay, so a monad of type capital A has a value of lowercase a, an instance of capital A. Um, and so basically you can think of a class that has an integer, it has one data member, that's just its value called integer. Okay. And this class defines two and only two interfaces. One is called the return function, which takes an instance of A, so let's say we're dealing with integers, so it takes like five, and it produces a monad with five in its value, an integer monad with five in its value. That, that's what return function does. So this is straight up just a constructor, a, a value constructor in C++, Java, C Sharp, where you have, you don't have an anonymous constructor, or you actually, have, there is one more function called unit, which is the anonymous constructor. It, it uh, initializes a, um, a monad with a default value for, for whatever A is by default. So in an integer system, that might be zero, you know, or undefined, depending on how you, what you care about default values being. Uh, but basically just a constructor, nothing revolutionary. The second thing is it's one functional interface it is called bind. The bind function is an operator, okay, on the monad, so let's just say monad of five, that takes a value, that takes a value of the monadic type, okay, that takes a function that takes a value of the monadic type and returns a uh, monad of another type, B, okay. So basically, I have this one virtual function in my class here called bind, or, or regular function called bind, that says, okay, I take an integer and I produce a monad that could also be a monad of type integer, it might be a monad of type string, it might be a monad of type patient or doctor, right? It depends on what this operation is supposed to do. And every single function that you want to build, okay, has to be broken down to this kind of logic. You have to be able to express it monadically. So here's a basic diagram of that, right? We have a monad of type A, okay? We have a function that takes an A and returns a monad of type B, and then at the other end we get a monad of type B. And it follows a couple of rules. Uh, the first are a couple of identity rules that boil down to saying if you pass uh, uh, in the bind function, if you, uh, uh, you know, if you bind a monad to a function, that's the same thing as just explicitly calling that function with a, with a value outside of monadic space. It's the exact same operation. So you, these functions are flying around like this function just takes an integer. You can just call it with an integer and you'll get back a monad of type B. You know, you don't have to have called it from a monad, but monad supports that. Um, there's the right identity, which says that if you bind your own return function to yourself, you'll make a copy of yourself. That's exactly the same monadic value. Okay, so it's just a copy constructor idea. But most importantly, it obeys, and you have to follow this string here, associativity. If you bind, if you have a monad A that binds to a function that produces a monad B, that binds to a function that produces a monad C, it does not matter in what order you do those bindings. Okay? Uh, you can do a binding all the way late down in the chain. Now, the value might not exist yet, but you can do the binding operation associatively. It ultimately does not care uh, uh, if, the, if uh, the results should be the same no matter what order you execute things in. Um, so that's the formal definition of it. Okay, and you'll see this two or three times. Do not worry if that, if, you know, if we went into glaze over space there, um, because fundamentally here is what this might look like in a object-oriented language. This is C sharp. Okay, this is my monad class. <coughs> Um, so basically we have a class monad, takes a type A, has a private member called value of type A, and it has a public value constructor that just makes the signs, you know, its input parameter to value, and it has a monadic bind function to some other type, which could, be, you know, be the same type as I, I am, which takes, what this is in C sharp, this is how you name a, a, a lambda function, it's a, uh, or how you type it. It says that takes a function, it takes an A, and returns a monad of B. And what it does is it goes 
it just calls that function with the value. So basically, a monad is, when they say a monad is a burrito, which is another bad answer, what they mean is that it's a wrapper, it's an object that supports a very thin interface, construction and this bind operation, that can wrap any value you want, any kind of crazy nonsense in there. You can have black beans, you can have jalapenos, you can have all kinds of, a bunch of imperative code, you can have references to web pages. It doesn't matter what the data is, the outer shell has this interface that plugs into other outer shells, and that allows us to do monadic chaining. So here's an example of how you would use uh, a monad explicitly. M1 is a new monad of integer with type 1, so its value is equal to 1. And then we say M2, take M1, and bind it to a function that takes an integer and returns a new monad of it, so not changing type, of i plus 1. And so now M2 will have a value of 2. And so this would be, this bind function would be an incrementer, right? And that's how you do it. Now, as I mentioned, Haskell, the language Haskell, which I recommend you take a look at, uh, is an explicitly monadic language. Okay, it defines everything in terms of of different monads. IO monad, reader monad, writer monad, its major libraries are all called monads. And it defines these bind functions explicitly. So you can, when you first start coding in Haskell, you, you do this syntax with the double greater thans and all this other stuff with the bindery, okay? And here are some really quick examples of like, here's how you increment a value and <coughs> taking an x, and it takes a function that takes its value a and returns just, which is a monad, like the one I just showed you, that wraps things without doing anything, uh, and takes just a plus one. Uh, absolute value, take x, binds to a function that if a is less than zero, they return ne uh, just negative a, other return, otherwise return just a, and down the list, only positive, okay? And one of the things you'll notice is that these are all unary functions that take one value. But what about plus, adding two values? That's accomplished with something called currying, um, which we're running out of time, so I won't go too heavily into. But basically, if you want to add two values together, what you do is you, t you have your first value binds to a function which, binds, which produces a monad that just takes the input parameter and uh, that takes an input parameter and adds it to whatever your A is. Okay? And what currying does is it says when you have multiple uh, parameters for a function, you break those down to a series of functions that take only one value and call the next function. So I'll say... <laughs> You know, I developed a, 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 I have a little function here that says add A to me, and I pass that back out, and then B comes in and says, okay, I've already got this add A to me that just gets called fun function. So the way that would look in, in an object-oriented language like C sharp here is like here is a function called add int, um, which takes uh, just one value, and it returns a function which takes one value and adds whatever parameter to it, right? So now you have a lambda that's being returned. That takes, an ad, that, that takes an integer, encapsulates it in that lambda, and expects you to call it with the other integer. And so to add 3 plus 4, you would say add int 3, which will return a function that will add 3 to anything that it's called with, and then call 4. Now, the reason I kind of went into this is that, especially if you look at this, this is an absolutely absurd and over-ceremonial way to define A plus B. <laughs> right. Uh, one of the big things, lessons with monadic design is that, like a Turing machine, you don't actually usually explicitly develop things as monads, except maybe in Haskell. Um, the idea is, can your design be broken down into a monadic description? If it can, then you're going to be able to take advantage of everything monads do for you. But you don't actually have to develop, like I don't use my monad class in C Sharp to do anything. I just wrote it as a, as a model. I write my functions trying to understand does this follow monadic design principle? But even Haskell, which is like thou shalt monad in Haskell, has a simplified syntax called the do syntax, which says, under the hood, these are all monads, but here you can just list out a series of instructions uh, like you would in C. Okay. So this leads us to the role of a monad in functional programming. Um, another Bad, quote unquote, bad answer. It's, a, it's an accurate answer. It's a good answer in a lot of ways, but it's bad in the fact that just saying it doesn't help people. Is that a monad is a programmable semicolon. So, what we have here is an example of some old assembly language from PDP 11, the original imperative programming. Go get some value, move it to this address, add one to it, move it left. You know, functions are just sort of this convenience macro thing, but really it's just a big, uninterrupted stream of instructions that can be jumping around anywhere. 
right, with go-tos and all kinds of crazy. Years later, we developed C, and we say we're going to start bundling some of these big concepts up, like print and add and that kind of thing, into verbs. And in the land of the nouns, the verbs are separated by semicolons. Every semicolon says, what just happened is a complete verb. If it's not, then I'm going to, like if I put a semicolon here, it's going to say that was not a complete verb. And then you get a compiler error. Because nouns own the world in, this, in the land of the nouns, verbs are collared by these semicolons. And the semicolons don't have to be programmable because you're corralling verbs, and verbs can do whatever you want them to do. They just have to be places that say, I, the noun, say that this is a verb. I, the noun, say that this is a verb. This is one of my verbs. This is one of my verbs. In the land of the verbs, it is the nouns that are corralled. Okay? So you say, I have a monad of type integer. And then something happens. And then I have a monad of type string. And then something happens. And then I have a monad of type doctor. And that something happens is the bind function on a monad. And it's for this reason called a programmable semicolon. Like here, this operation that takes you from noun A to noun B okay, is programmable. You get to decide how we move from A to B. Whereas this operation that takes you from declaring an integer to printing something out, integer array, is not programmable. Okay. So this leads us to what I think is the, uh, the, the, the answer for great good <laughs> in, uh, in monadic design, is that a monad is a functional design pattern that allows chained operations to propagate results from previous operations without affecting the global state, without interfering with each other. So now, when you're running on a multi-core system, all these independent functions that know that they don't change the global state can run independently, and you don't have to schedule the CPUs yourself as an app developer, you can trust the OS and say, this is an independent block of code, this is an independent block of code, this is an independent block of code, and you schedule it any way you want. I don't have to worry about collisions, okay? And without unneeded computation, if I am going and getting a value that has a field that has a million results in it, but I'm only interested in 5,000 of them, I'm not gonna pay for the rest of the million, okay? You can also do that in imperative programming, but you have to think <coughs> of it yourself. Now these systems can be designed because they know there were no side effects, there's no, when you fetch a value, you haven't changed the outcome of something globally in the world. I know that I can wait until you actually ask. <laughs> and so monadic design gives us the ability to verify that we are moving from one noun space, one highly typed object wrapper, integer, you know, monad of integer, to monad of string, to monad of doctor, to monad of list of patients, using steps, programmable semicolons, lambda functions, okay, that maintain this chaining with those criteria. And because those criteria have become so critical to us in programming just in the last 10 years or so, that's why we're suddenly interested in functional programming in the real world. Uh, because it provides a solution to apps, to web browsers, to, web, to, to all these systems that have to wait for results. Okay, and that might have a huge result space that they're only interested in small parts of. It's also useful for us in gaming and other places like that where we are facing intense multi-core systems where we really want to optimize the use of all the different cores, but we don't want to have to design a lot of bookkeeping and ceremonial code ourselves to, to wrestle that together. So I have one last slide here. Here's the resources I recommend. Learn you Haskell for great good. That was my reference in the previous slide by uh, Miran Lipovaka. Uh, you know, spend a weekend with Haskell. Uh, if you're, you're doing language development, uh, it's a very, very different uh, type of space where you have to divine, define all your type relationships perfectly, crystallinely, purely to even get a run. And when you do that, you find you have fewer bugs in your actual execution code because it forces the high-level design to make sense first, which very few other, like almost no other programming languages do that, right? Um, my own experience with it is I find it, that it has some challenges scaling, but it's, it's a young language in terms of being adopted. Facebook is using uh, Haskell for all of their data queries. I think it's a relatively smart thing, especially if they develop some good scalable tools for it. So if you're interested in web developments and big data kind of development, absolutely spend a little time with Haskell. You'll, you'll find it intelligent, uh, intellectually challenging. Uh, Monads for Functional Programming by Philip Walder, University of Glasgow, an old paper. I, it's 10 or 15 years old, I think. Um, it goes more deeply into the math of what I was just showing there and, and provides more examples and examples in Haskell. And so if you are more interested in how the bind and the return operations work and how this <coughs> monadic design really results in, 
in state propagation and why select many is, is so cool. Uh, this is, it's more mathematical. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a computer science paper, but it's, it, it's the foundation for all this conversation. I uh, already talked about Venkat and Martin Odersky. Absolutely, these guys, in terms of the practical, like, give me some examples that I might do for a job. Why don't you show me why this is better? Uh, these guys are great sort of, you know, uh, hands on their gears types. And the biggest one, if you're interested in this topic, and I'm sure you're going to come out of this lecture with uncertainty <laughs> as to what this is all about, who explained the uh, concept more clearly than I did is Brian Beckham. I can't possibly hold a candle. He's a fantastic uh, computer scientist. Uh, and his talk on YouTube, Don't Fear the Monad, where he explains the relationship between monoids and endofunctors and monads and shows how this is really a simple idea. Uh, he is the source of most of what I've been talking about to you about today. Uh, so uh, the clarity, uh, when I, after I watched Brian, that's when I decided to do this talk. <laughs> it's because I finally got it. I see what you're saying. Okay, it's just this thing that propagates values without, without affecting the world in a way that will screw anybody else up. Got it. Um, so that's it for me. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.